Hello, hello, and welcome back to Bumblebee, my freaks and geeks. I'm your host, Teresa, and we are getting down and dirty with the top 10 scandalous figures in history you weren't taught. We're gonna start with a classic, the Death House Landlady. Social workers in the 1970s looked up upon Dorothea Puente and her boarding house with admiration. Puente had a reputation for taking in people considered tough cases, recovering alcoholics, addicts, the mentally ill, the elderly. And she was so sweet looking too. Aw, look at the little cardigans, cute cottage house. Well, psych, you guys. Puente spent her youth being a huge piece of human garbage, abandoning any children she had, eating out of jail, others, so naturally, she opens a boarding home, which she loses spectacularly fast after getting caught signing her own name on her tenant's benefit checks. In the 1980s, she worked as a personal caretaker who drugged her clients and stole their valuables very Cardi B style, so she got sent to prison. Then she said round two and opened another boarding house. This would be the death house. For years, the disappearances went unnoticed, even by their probation officers. Puente's cute old lady gimmick and some wicked scone recipes was her meal ticket to getting away, but eventually, like all killers, the wrong person goes missing eventually. While a tenant at first backed up Puente's usual lie that the person had left on vacation, he slips a note to the police before they left saying it was untrue. So they ask permission to do a little landscaping, you know, dig up the yard. Puente's all like, yeah, of course, why not? Here, even take this extra shovel, get to digging. Then she asked if she would be okay to go buy a coffee. They said yes, because she's an a thousand year old lady. What could she possibly do? She dipped, they find seven bodies, and Puente finds herself a sunny vacation in Los Angeles on the lam for five days when police catch her before she can Mary Poppins herself away again. She received multiple life sentences. I love a sustainable gift, but this? Thrifting and gifting done wrong. It's 1861 and Mary Pichon is looking for work that doesn't require her having womanly assets. Luckily, she meets a kind man whose intentions seem genuinely good, hearty work for her, and so she lets him lead her into the woods. Oh, you see where horror movies get their inspiration. People really go, hmm, okay, and then prance on after inevitable danger, and it's danger Mary meets once the guy attacks her. Mary, who somehow manages to escape, runs for her life as he chases her through the woods all the way to a nearby village, and she tells authorities who promptly go find him. When they find him, they find two bodies and piles of female clothing inside of his property, bloodstained and torn, which didn't bother Miss Drummelard at all, who's just been out here wearing this clothing. And yes, homegirl knew her husband was ripping them off of the women he was killing. The clothes, by the way, implied hundreds of women had died on their property. Drummelard was found guilty of six murders and they chopped his head off in 1862, which by the way is a way better fate than his daddy, who was part of the plot to kill the King of Austria and got ripped apart by ponies. His wife, meanwhile, got 20 years for running around in dead people clothes. Let's meet a crazy nun who put back on everything. Ah, 15th century Milan. This is where Mariana di Levea Marino was born to a wealthy banker who dumped her on her aunt and took off. He remembered she existed at 13, long enough to force her into a convent in Monza. Now a nun, she did pretty aight. She was a role model, did stuff diligently, very Jesus-y, I don't know what nuns do. I do know that in her 20s, she fell for an aristocratic womanizer, which is hella out of character for a nun. Gianno Sio and Mariana were sinning it up all over the place. He had a blacksmith make key to the convent to sneak in, and they even had secret kids. But Marianne alternated between gratifying her lust or just guilt tripping over that sin. So in her brain, to try and make herself hate him, she started beating his feces. It did not work. His feces hit the fan when a nun threatens to whistleblow the affair, so Oseo smokes her. Then, to cover their tracks, since rumors started about a missing nun, they decide to kill more people. Oseo kills the blacksmith, while Marianne deals with an apothecary that supplied her some anti-baby herbs once. Yeah, it didn't work. Governor Milan sits everyone down in a torture chamber and says, let's talk this out. Oseo manages to sneak away and he's sentenced to execution absentatia. Marianne, meanwhile, gets bricked up in solitary confinement for 15 years until she's a hollow empty shell and they let her out to live out in a convent. The end, fairy tale romance. She's known by many names, but I will introduce her as the bloody B word. And the most prolific serial killer of the Western world, Elizabeth Bathory was niece to Stephen Bathory, head of the eminent Hungarian family and Prince of Transylvania, who later even became the King of Poland in 1575. She was married to Count Nastasi, and they lived at Karachin Castle in the Carpathian Mountains, now Slovakia, in the 1600s. Okay, what else, what else? Uh, oh yeah, she, uh, she practiced vampirism because this is Transylvania and everything's a joke, I guess. She is alleged to have killed more than 650 
Christian women with the help of four servants, specifically those with qualities such as great beauty, intelligence, strength, etc., in order to drink their blood and bathe in it. Her reasoning for this was to preserve her youth and beauty. Word was beginning to spread about her sadistic activities. At first, victims were servants in her castle, then they were daughters of local peasants, and later they included girls sent to her by local gentry families wanting them to learn good manners from a deranged Twilight fan. When her murderous career was discovered, the Countess was walled up in her castle from 1610 until her death in 1614. She's also the inspiration for the famous sapphic female Dracula counterpart, Carmilla. Before I go crazy, tell me I'm pretty. So from 1971 to 72, police officers were having a bit of an issue. Super weird, creepy graveyard crimes. Someone had been exhuming corpses from their graves and interfering with them, which we all know is code for they are a perv. They had five bodies on their hands that had been tampered with, even chewed on a little, and some showed signs of adult activities having transpired. Then on the flip side, May 6, 1972, a young couple is found killed in their car. That crime's different. Why connect them? The female body showed evidence that the killer had been trying to drink her blood like a big gulp and had done more gross stuff. Later, the same thing happens to a lone woman with the same posthumous rituals. Then a mortuary worker is just trying to do his literal job and walks in on someone locking lips with a cold cadaver who proceeds to freak out on being caught. Not great since he had a weapon. Mortuary worker survives his wound and eventually identifies Kuno Hoffman as his attacker. Hoffman confesses to everything, no hesitation, the graveyard creeping, and the killings. His motivations had to be explained through a translator. Kuno had undergone extreme treatment as a child and was now mute and deaf. After a previous prison sentence, he turned to the occult for solace. Studied from Satan books and got in his head if he did some weird stuff to corpses, he could become handsome and popular finally, that people would like him. Kuno Hoffman was confined to an asylum for life, and while his backstory is not an excuse for his actions, it is an explanation. So a reminder that sometimes treating others with kindness can make all the difference in the world. How about some recent history to remind you these people aren't solely of the past? The Westfield Watcher. Derek and Maria Broadus filed a lawsuit in the Union County, New Jersey, alleging that their home's former owners had failed to warn them about a local individual who calls him or herself the Watcher. Are they a neighborhood gossip rag? Maybe an old coot who can't mind their business. Maybe a neighbor who leaves passive-aggressive notes. Wrong, wrong, and wrong. In 2015, one of the strangest cases in modern history appeared when a letter was mailed to the new owners of a home. Dated June 4th, 2014. You can find the transcripts of these lawsuits online and they do contain the letters, so I figured why not directly read some for you guys? Alright, so here's some fun lines from letter one. The house has been subject of my family for decades. I have been put in charge of watching it and waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched the house in the 1920s. My father watched the house in the 1960s. It is now my time. The watcher also asks the couple, do you need to fill the house with young blood I requested? Remind me to ask for young blood as a new housewarming gift in case I don't know I, I might need that. Second and third letters were also just as deranged. Listen to this. Have they found what's in the walls yet? In time they will. Who has the bedroom facing the street? I'll know as soon as you move in. It will help me know who is in which bedroom, then I can plan better. All of the windows and doors in 657 Boulevard allow me to watch you and track you as you move through the house. No information on who the watcher might be or why they sent out the letters has come to light. Letters contain implication, however, that this person's lineage once owned and dwelled in this home. The entire Broadius family has vacated the house in fear of their safety, but who will buy it next? Believe it or not, his head is on display in Ripley's Wisconsin, the vampire of Dusseldorf. Also known as Dusseldorf's monster, Peter Curtin killed at least nine people in 1929, Dusseldorf, Germany. All right, so firstly, what made him so difficult to catch was he kept changing MOs. Not to freak you guys out, but historically, this works incredibly well for police evasion and is the reason we have so many uncaught, unconnected cases today. Sometimes he used scissors or a hammer or his bare hands. Eventually when he is caught, it's due to a postal mistake. See, Maria was nearly a strangulation victim of curtains on May 14, 1930. She didn't report the the police, but she wrote about it in a letter to a friend, and the letter she addressed incorrectly. Because of the incorrect address, a clerk at the post office opened it, read it, went, what the hell, and forwarded it to the police, who then found and interviewed Maria and said, yo girl, we got something we need to talk about. She said the reason Curtin had let her go is she told him she couldn't remember his address, where he had taken her before taking her to the woods. Yeah, no, she remembered it just fine, to the point she said, grab your coats, boys, let's go for a little walk. Curtin was arrested and found guilty of nine killings and seven attempted. He was 
executed by guillotine on July 2nd, 1931. Then weirdly, his head is dissected and mummified and now displayed at Ripley's, believe it or not, in Wisconsin. If you're kosher like me, you have to worry about what's in your food. But for those who ate at Carl Grossman's cart, they really had to wonder, what's in a hot dog? The last name Grossman really suited him because even before he rented his greasy slum house in the 1920s Berlin, Grossman was packing a rep sheet of some seriously wonky criminal charges. And apparently, despite that, no red flags went off when tenants heard endless screaming echoing from his apartment, or when his highly unusual amount of female visitors would literally never leave. Suspicions literally weren't even raised until more than 20 bodies were discovered in a nearby waterway. Then police declared they had a serious on the loose. Wow, shocking. Authorities were finally alerted the next time they screaming started in Grossman's rooms, and in August 1921, they burst in to find him standing over the found body of a woman he had just killed, horror movie style. He was suspected of at least 23 other slayings, but took his own life on July 5th, 1922, before he could be executed. Grossman was given the title The Butcher of Berlin as a result of bizarre rumors surrounding his crime. See, our boy Grossman spent a lot of time in Berlin's Sicilian train station, which is where he picked up many of the women he would take back to his apartment to victimize, women whose bodies were never found. He also sold hot dogs to hungry travelers at the very same station, with a copious supply of them to boot, despite the food and especially meat shortages in Berlin at the time. So ladies and gentlemen, what is in a hot dog? There had to be a cult somewhere in here, right? Well, this one operated on the ideology that I'm sure they'll be back, right? But not everyone is like Jesus, trooping on out of his grave a couple days after ending up in it. Margareta Peter, though, thought if anyone was, it was damn well her. Fiercely Religious, she spent some of her 20s wandering Switzerland to preach the word of God, and by 29 she had settled back in her small hometown with a loyal congregation, many of which were immediate family. Woo, we love a supportive family. In fact, they were so supportive that when Margareta in 1823 became convinced that the devil was living in the rafters, they all went, yeah, yeah, that must be true. They had the same reaction to her declaration of being the Messiah, and then to her saying she's gonna start a battle against Satan. So naturally her whole congregation starts smashing up the house with farm tools, before Margareta suddenly announces to turn the tools on each other. So while a Kingsman style battle is going down, Margareta ups the ante saying she needs to be sacrificed Jesus style, but her sister jumps up, Katniss Everdeen like, and volunteers. So the collective congregation, including the whole family, swarm and kill her. Followers rip up floorboards, make a makeshift cross that they, well, then crucified Margs, y'all. The, the real deal. They lifted the cross up, Margs hollered she's gonna come back in three days, and told him to bash her head in, which they did. Then everyone just kinda waited around. Three days go by, neither sister rise, and folks are starting to scratch their heads and look around a little, and finally somebody gets the police on this. They pull up, everyone goes in the paddy wagon, and off to jail. And now for the kiss goodnight. Lonely heart killers. They lure victims in via personal ads in the newspapers, which is an archaic ass sentence to say, but hey, one less way to die nowadays with newspapers going out of style. But Tinder did replace it, I guess. Bella Kiss spent some of the early years of the 1900s corresponding with women he connected with through ads in the newspaper. Yes, they had personal ads back then, but Whatever. The women never seemed to stick around for long though. In 1914, Kiss was conscripted and went off to fight in the First World War, leaving behind his home, shed, a lovely little garden, a neatly trimmed lawn, and a collection of large metal drums on the property, which he told neighbors contained gasoline. During the summer of 1916, Kiss was still away and some soldiers had approached the constable of Kinkota, which is where Kiss lived, inquiring about emergency fuel. Well, the constable remembers his homeboy Kiss has these big ass barrels and he could definitely spare some for his fellow soldiers. However, when one of the drums was open, there was no gasoline found in it. Instead, there was a human body. And in the next drum. And in the next drum. By the time they do a full search of Kiss's property, 24 bodies had been found. And Kiss, however, never was. Attempts to locate him were fruitless. The closest authorities ever came was in October of 1916, when a letter led them to a Serbian hospital in which Kiss had been allegedly recuperating from a battlefield injury. They scramble themselves over there like the Scooby-Doo gang. But by the time they arrived, he was already gone, having placed the body of a dead soldier in his bed instead and we still don't know where he went. Alrighty, I hope this inspired some creeps and shivery spines. If so, mission achieved. I hope you guys enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe and comment down below who you think some of the most terrible and gnarly of killers are.